If you enjoy this content, please like and comment to feed the algorithm god. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. In the days before man first spoke, the world sphere appeared. It pierced a lifeless planet deep in the unknowns of space. It was a cataclysm tearing apart the skies and rending the ground. Soon after, the wraiths emerged from the monolith. They took dominion over this planet and brought forth a new era. They flew across the lands and bellowed their mighty wraith call upon it. This brought forth vitality and awakening, many forms of a grand evolution. Argent Denur, it would be. In this primordial age, the lands were unforgiving and hostile. The beasts that arose were fierce, and the first people to emerge were the Ancestrals. These titans were feral, their violence fueled by the magics of the wraiths that still soared across the lands. The Ancestrals began to wage war with one another, and for countless years, they tore Argent Denor apart in their rampage. But the bellowing of the wraith call still awoke other forms of life. The humanoids, called the Argenta, stirred into form from the power of their breath. Hidden away in the mountains of Argent Denur, the Argenta learned the art of weapon forging, crafting tools of brutality in the dark, suffocating heat of their home. They became born of rock and fire, lowly in birth, but through their own determination and strength, they became challengers of the Ancestrals. The Argenta forged sword and shield and took hammer against the wild Titan Ancestrals. They conquered their primal elders, and the time of man came to be. They tamed the lands and the creatures that walked it, built cities and temples. Upon an obsidian throne, they crowned a king, or Mero the Father. All kings of the Argenta had to be warriors that could lead their armies into battle. A king who could not do this was unfit to rule. The strongest held power and the wise retained it. The Cathedral of Reflection was created to honor the wraiths that birthed all life on Argent Denur. The priests of the Order of the Dag worked to honor and appease the wraiths, who proved to be unpredictable, both in their rage and their grace. Yet still, they were cornerstones of the Argenta's way of life. The young of the Argenta pursued the path of the sword or the path of alchemy to honor the gods. The song of the wraiths still persisted, and those who heard the melody of them risked falling into madness. You see, the wraith call could induce insanity in lesser men. But some within the Argenta rose above it. Their warriors hardened themselves in battle against the hordes of barbarian tribes, and the mightiest of them emerged as protectors of the wraiths, the Sentinels. The Argenta thrived under their king, Ormero the Father, and leadership passed, as always it should, down the line of their most powerful warriors. When the mantle of king went to the king Etrix during the time of grief, something miraculous happened. Something that would forever change the fates of the Argenta, the Sentinels, and the Order of the Deg. The Makers found Argent Denur. Never had the Argenta seen beings like the Makers, they were transfixed by them. They were covered in golden and porcelain plating, as though of armor. They lumbered over the Argenta, and their weapons held no hold against the Makers. But the Makers did not come to wage a war against this blossoming people. Rather, these ethereal-like beings paid them flattery. They honored their achievements, observed the great deeds that the Argenta held so much pride over, and admired their convictions. The Makers did not come as conquerors, rather they came as friends. The Argenta accepted their extended hand, and a bond was formed between the two vastly different races. The Makers bestowed many gifts upon the Argenta, greater tech to enhance their cities, armors, weaponry, knowledge of other worlds and dimensions which the Makers could travel between as they held sway over all dominions. But perhaps most importantly, the Makers gave to the Argenta a belief in the afterlife, the security in knowing that even beyond death there was a calling. Their mortal plane was not the end. If the Argenta lived in strength and in purity, then the Makers themselves would usher them into a great city in the clouds, where their ancestors would be awaiting their arrival. The Argenta came to worship the Makers as gods. They adopted their holy doctrines as laws of the land. They gave them higher favor than the wraiths, for the Makers gave them hope in an afterlife and enhanced their world. The Wraiths were a constant threat of madness. They were symbols of the primordial ways. The priests of the Order of the Dag still saw to their keeping and their appeasement. The Sentinels still protected and served them. The Argenta still feared and loved them. But the Makers, they were approachable. They were tangible. They brought hope for the future. Therefore, they were as gods in their own way to the Argenta. But who really were these Makers? Well. Though they seem angelic, the Makers were of flesh and blood. The Argenta served their rays, and the Makers served the Father. 
According to their legends, the Father created all realities and realms. It was through him that all worlds and their inhabitants were birthed. The first of his creations were the Seraphim, molded from the void itself. The Seraphim flew through the cosmos at his side, assisting him in crafting and research, carrying his will to the far reaches of all creation. Only when the Father stopped to rest did the planet Erdak appear, and upon the planet Erdak, the Makers were created. Under his grace, the Makers created a home that was unrivaled technologically. Under his grace, the Makers became the most prolific and powerful race in all the universe. They were as a hive mind, led by one called the Khan Maker. Every single of the Maker were interconnected, their memories and lives contained within the singularity. It was through the singularity that the Khan Maker was given birth. Therefore, the Khan Maker was all-knowing amongst them, and it was impossible for any of the Makers to disobey them. It was perfection. After an enigmatic battle called the Battle of Isencast, the Seraphim were stripped of their wings and cast down as lesser beings upon the planet Erdak, now called the Seraphs. The Seraphs became like the Makers, serving the Father at their side. To atone for their unspoken sins, the Seraphs built the Luminarium on Erdak, where they would build machines that could harness and contain the essence of life. And in atonement, the Father commanded that should any reach the Luminarium, the Seraphs would serve them. They were bound to favor none, to act neutrally. The Seraphs created the Life Spheres, which contained the memory, intelligence, will, and nature of a being's consciousness. Though the Makers were long living, they were not eternal. When it was their time to pass, they did not face a traditional humanoid death. Rather, they underwent transfiguration. Their bodies and minds would begin to degrade, so they voluntarily faced death and rejoined the singularity, and through the powers of the Father, they were reborn anew. Every 10,000 years, a new Khan Maker would be born directly from the singularity, and the old Khan Maker underwent their transfiguration, preparing to pass into the singularity. All the data collected from the previous 10,000 years was added to the knowledge of the new Khan. Their rebirth would be into something superior, stronger, and better suited to lead. When the Makers found the Argenta on the planet Argent Denur, the heavenly city in the sky that they promised them was their homeworld, Erdak. When the Father created the realm Jakkad, it was to be superior to that of Erdak, as he made the inhabitants quite akin to the Makers, but without the restraint of thought that sometimes plagued them. They would not question themselves, nor would they hesitate. While the Makers and their planet Erdak had the Khan Maker to rule over them, this new realm called Jakkad was given an immortal demigod called Davith to shepherd them. But the people of Jakkad did not have the seeming immortality of the Makers, which greatly troubled Davith. He would see anything done to give his people eternal life. In Jakkad, they created many mechanical and technological wonders, but the Father feared the unbridled ambition of the people of Jakkad. So, to keep safe other planets and realms from their fervor, the Father and the Makers cut off the planet Jakkad from other planets and sealed them away within their realm. This was seen as a betrayal by Davith, who longed to use Maker technology to bring immortality to his own people. And in his rage, Davith changed. He became the Dark Lord, and the planet Jakkad followed suit, becoming Hell, and its people becoming the dreaded demons that all would come to fear. The forces of Hell were eventually able to break through their containment to feed upon other worlds. The Dark Lord and his demons grew ever stronger and a greater threat to all life. So, the Father traveled to Hell and he battled the Dark Lord. The Father claimed victory over the Dark Lord but couldn't bring himself to fully snuff out the one once called Davith. For the Father once loved Davith. So, he had the Dark Lord's life sphere contained within the Temple of Souls, his own fortified and secret personal workshop on the planet Erdak. The realm of Hell was without its leader. The Father withdrew into his own life sphere, having it hidden away within the Luminarium where the Seraphs served him. That's a lovely origin story for the Makers. Truly a favored and unrivaled people beloved by the Father, but what is the truth? Well, let's not be coy about it. For as beautiful a tale as it might seem, the origin of all creation, it's, uh, well, it's not really what happened. What dirty little secrets do the Makers guard? In truth, the Father was the one who would become known as the Dark Lord. The Father was Davith, and Davith created first the world of Jakkad as the eldest of all realms. Davith commanded the mighty Seraphims. Davith created Erdak and the Makers. It was by Davith's hand that all things came to be. He'd meant to use the Makers to discover how to give his beloved people in Jakkad immortality. Yes, this is true. 
the makers deem their technology, their singularity, their hive mind, their immortality through rebirth to be too dangerous a thing to share with others. So they betrayed Dabith and the planet Jakkad. The makers sealed them away, thus usurping the father as the overseers of his many realms and creations. Davoth was consumed by this betrayal, consumed by hatred that his own children would turn against him, forsake him. He and the planet Jakkad changed into a darkness, intent on taking vengeance. The one, once called the father, became the Dark Lord. Jakkad became hell and its people evil, all-consuming demons. The Makers chose one of their own to become a new father, and they rewrote history to cover up what had actually happened. But such a mighty being as Davoth, the true father and now the Dark Lord, could not be so easily contained. The Dark Lord led the forces of hell forward, growing ever powerful. They broke out of their containment and began consuming other planets to feed their dark armies. And though hell was a violent, evil place, it was certainly not primitive. The Dark Lord and his servants developed technologies that could convert other life forms into demons. They could harness the life energies of their victims to empower their own. Their tools of war were unmatched. The only way to slow down the March of Hell's armies would be to take out their Dark Lord, take out the head of the beast. So. The New Father did venture into Hell and come into direct conflict with the Dark Lord. The New Father defeated him, and his life sphere was taken to be sealed away. The New Father had love in his heart for the one who had created him in the first place, and he couldn't bring himself to kill Davith. So, the now Dark Lord was sealed away within the Temple of Souls on Erdak, and the truth of who he was was kept secret from all others. The New Father also withdrew into his own life sphere and entrusted its care into the Seraphs within the Luminarium. In particular, the one called Samer was tasked with seeing to the father's safety by the father himself. In secret, the father told Samer that if trouble from hell was sensed, then Samer was to take his life sphere away from the Makers, away from the other Seraphim, away from the Luminarium to hide it away from all. For Samer to do this would be seen as heresy by the other Makers, but Samer's loyalty to the father made this a request that he would honor. So Samer kept an eye on hell and the other Makers in secret. Likewise, the Dark Lord, his spirit contained and imprisoned, began to scheme his creation's unmaking. Samer was called to action before Hell broke loose. Performing an act of heresy, he stole away the father and whisked him to the Ingmor's sanctum. Samer kept the father hidden away, safe from the threat perceived. Because of this withdrawal of the father, the Maker's process of rebirth of transfiguration became interrupted. They did not have a power source to fuel it, their immortality was under threat and the con maker themselves could not be remade through the singularity. So she, the current con maker, began to look for alternatives to sustain the makers and herself. On Argent Denur, during the time of King Novik, an outlander appeared. From where he came, they did not know. Sentinel scouts found him bloodied and near death, mumbling of doom and the forces of darkness. He was certainly not of their world. His armor seemed alien and the weapons he carried were arcane. The Outlander was offered the chance to prove himself, as was dictated by Argenta law. If he survived his wounds, he would fight in the Colosseum, but his mind was so consumed by rage and madness, his body so damaged and broken it was doubtful that he would, yet somehow he did. He did recover, and he fought in their Colosseum. He fought with brutality and with a fury the Argenta did not recognize, but with a determination that they understood. Those that witnessed the spectacle cheered his banner, rip and tear. The Outlander was victorious. He was given no special rank nor title, but he joined the Argenta as common rabble. His strange tongue and mad ravings were made known to the Khan Maker on the planet Erdak, who took an interest in this strange humanoid. The Khan demanded that her underlings learn his language and decipher his ravings. They discovered that he was speaking of hell, of demons and horrors unknown to them. The Argenta believed the Outlander was telling them of a place that the gifts and message of the Makers needed to reach. The Khan Maker kept secret the truth of what he spoke. Hell was coming, doom approaching. His wild prophetic ravings proved true. On the eve of the Black Star, Hell broke through the fabric of dimensions and invaded Argent de Nour. Outer settlements and cities rapidly fell to the demon's onslaught. The Sentinels prepared to engage them and when the two forces clashed, it began an unholy war. But the mighty Sentinels of Argent de Nour could not defeat the demon hordes that continued to pour out of that portal to Hell. The weaponry of Hell was unlike anything the Argenta had ever fought against, but they held back the Hellspawn from complete victory. The Sentinels were able to obtain some of their weaponry so that their engineers and priests of the Order of the Dag could study it, perhaps decipher some of their secrets. But what they found was that the forces of Hell were empowered by a life essence that caused their twisted appearance and made their weapons so devastating. 
and this life essence caught the attention of the Con Maker. The Con Maker was now the indefinite ruler of Erdak. With no way to birth a new Con, there was no other way. Out of eventual desperation, she began to look outwards to new energy sources that could power their technology and preserve the Maker's way of life. This life essence that flowed through the bodies and weapons of these demons could be just the solution that she needed. A new Dark Lord had stepped in to control the forces of Hell, though they were not nearly the force that Davith was. It was during this invasion of Argent Denor that the Khan Maker approached them with a compromise. Hell had long since mastered the tech to harvest energy from the soul, so what if they could share in it, combine their technologies to create something superior to benefit them both? Well, how could the new Dark Lord refuse? In Hell, the Maker saw built grand soul spires that would more efficiently harvest souls and energies, creating a new form of it called Argent Energy. And in return, the forces of Hell were allowed access to other worlds so that they might conquer and consume them. Unlimited energy for Erdak, more power for Hell. But for Argent Denor, there was no reprieve from the Holy War. Their armor, weaponry, and defenses were bolstered by the Makers and by Hell technologies, making the mighty Sentinels ever more powerful with each passing season. Though mighty as they were, the forces of Argent Denor could not stop the Hellspawn. The Order of the Dag took counsel with the King and convinced him that the Sentinels must go through the portal themselves and fight the demons on their home turf. That maddened Outlander fought on the front lines alongside the Sentinels, and did so with such ferocity that King Novik deemed him worthy of selection, something never done to an outsider before. The Outlander was lifted from the common rabble and given the training of a Sentinel. He proved himself to be unwavering in his convictions to defeat the demons, and a reliable compatriot in their efforts. The Outlander was friend to none and a fearsome being to behold. He was given every bit of training the Sentinels could offer and eventually ascended into the ranks of the Night Sentinels. He journeyed with them into Hell itself, never asking for assistance, fighting relentlessly at their sides. He proved to be an ally and a powerful weapon. The people of Argent Denur knew not the treachery at play against them. The Khan Maker had betrayed them in her dealings with the new Dark Lord. Argent Denur was not the only world that Hell invaded and it grew stronger by the day. The priests of the Order of the Dag and the Makers themselves convinced the Argenta people to consume the energy that now came from Hell, not knowing that by doing so, they would serve as fuel for it upon death. Their souls would go to those terrible soul spires and their bodies would become demons. They were allowing every world under the Makers' dominion to be invaded. When a Titan, the Dreadnought, emerged from Hell, it began to assault the heartlands of Argent Denur. What could possibly stop something like this? All the Sentinel ranks gathered a defense against it, but the question to how something so massive could get through the demonic gate with no warning began to play on the fears of the Night Sentinels. Was treason at play? Were they being betrayed? The holy city of Teres Nevad fell to the demons, and only the few that were able to flee the city survived. The Night Sentinels were able to push the demon invaders back, with the Outlander aiding them, but they just could not best that Titan Dreadnought. From afar, the one called Samur watched. Samur had been safekeeping the life sphere of the Father, taking him away from the Makers before everything began to fall apart, thus ending their cycle of immortality. Through an ancient rite, Samur blessed the Outlander with power. Samur put him into a holy coffin, which purified his body and gave rise to a whole new being. The Outlander rose and drew a crucible weapon that burned with wraith flame. He pushed forth and he killed the Dreadnought, thus he took a new name, the Slayer. In their darkest hour, a hero had emerged. The Slayer would be the ultimate weapon in combat against the forces of Hell. The tides were churned. And while the Khan Maker was uneasy with this ascension, she soon proclaimed the Slayer to be a holy relic reborn, which would carry out the will of the Makers. With the coming of the Slayer, the Night Sentinels took countless victories and were able to push farther into the depths of Hell to combat their great foes. This was certainly unexpected by the Khan Maker. For the depths of Hell, their betrayal was uncovered. The Night Sentinels found the Soul Spires, found Argenta slaves building them, found their people being tortured as fuel, and discovered that the elixir their people had been consuming was the essence of their own kin. Some of the demons they'd faced in battle had once been Argenta and of other Sentinel ranks. Only the Night Sentinels had refrained from consuming the elixir, out of fear and respect for their own traditions. When the Night Sentinels made it back to Argent Denur, they began to speak of the things they saw in Hell. And thus, a sentinel insurrection began to take form. The masses of Argent Denur did not heed the words of the Night Sentinels. They were too embedded in their way of life, too dependent on the elixir of the priests, and they were unwilling to turn against the mother god called the Khan Maker. 
The makers called the words of the Sentinels a test of faith upon the masses to test their convictions, and reminded them that only the faithful would find paradise in death. The Night Sentinels, the Slayer, and the few faithful to the Rays and the Old Ways began plotting a new way forward. They would trek back into Hell and see the factories of Argent Energy destroyed. They each felt responsibility at what had happened to their people. Their own blindness haunted them. They would do anything to see it undone and set right, even if it meant taking up arms against their own people. Those who could not break through their own indoctrination were now as enemies to the Sentinel insurrection. A civil war began. On one front, the Argenta fought demons. On the other front, they fought each other. After years of this war, the priests of the Order of the Deg assured the Night Sentinels that their path to the Argent Energy factories in Hell were clear for approach. The Night Sentinels didn't know that their own priests and one of their commanders had turned against them. The commander Valen had lost his son during the war, a loss that drove him to the brink. One of the priests of the Order of the Deg, the one called Deg Grav, promised Valen that if he'd give the priests direct access to the Rays, then they would see his son resurrected. Valen agreed and gave the priests access to the slumbering raids. They were stolen away into the depths of hell where their power would be siphoned away to create even more powerful Argent energy. With the power of the raids at their disposal, the legions of hell were unstoppable. They marched upon Argent Denur when the Night Sentinels departed for hell. None could oppose the forces of hell now, and the Night Sentinels were scattered throughout hell, finding themselves to be overrun during their journey. The commander's son was resurrected as the Icon of Sin a terrible demon titan that was the physical embodiment of Hell's cruelty. In shame, the commander exiled himself into the depths of Hell and became known as the Betrayer. Though they were scattered and then trapped in Hell, the Night Sentinels did not give up their fight. They killed untold numbers of demons as their numbers slowly dwindled. They let only rage and bloodlust fuel them as they faced their deaths. Their heroic deeds became the stuff of legends, and so too passed into fable the fate of the Slayer himself. Some say that he still fights in the depths of hell, bringing punishment upon those that wronged the Sentinels. May the blood of his sword never dry. May his war never end until the guilty have been punished. And may this evil never again spread its shadow over another world. The father knew that soon, humanity would discover Argent Energy and his faithful servant, Samer, stood in agreement with this inevitability. So they began to plan. They would try to guide humanity on this path. If they could not avoid a disaster, then they would try to help this planet called Earth via the Slayer. So, Samer went to Earth, and he created a human body that he placed his consciousness into. He would be called Samuel Hayden, eventually Dr. Samuel Hayden. The public knew him as a marvelous intellectual and proponent of the sciences, establishing grants and scholarships to support a variety of fields and the youths that wished to study them. He eventually became the general director of the Global Science Council. Samuel mentored a very promising young woman named Olivia Pierce and sponsored her during her education. When Samuel took work at the Global Science Council, he saw that she was promoted into a position there as well. He had great faith that she would have an outstanding career. Olivia went on to help found the Nanostruct Aerospace and Defense Systems with a little help from Samuel in the form of a sizable donation. Samuel didn't stay at the Global Science Council for too long. Towards the latter years of the 21st century, a corporation called the Union Aerospace Corporation recruited him. The UAC had been sending expeditions to the planet Mars, as several decades prior, it was discovered that there was water on Mars, sparking interest into the mysteries of the planet. When Argent Plasma was discovered on Mars by a UAC expedition, Dr. Samuel Hayden began making moves in the company. Within a few months, Samuel was the leader of the UAC, and he immediately ordered the construction of the Argent Tower. The tower would see the plasma harvested from the fracture, converted into usable energy, and beamed back to Earth. Within a year, an outpost was established on Mars, and in 2127, the Argent Tower was completed. The size and complexity of the structure was surreal. It came to house over 60,000 employees during its height. Running the Argent Tower and the day-to-day -day operations of such a massive complex required the use of an AI, one of Samuel Hayden's own design. It would be called Vega, and in actuality, Vega was the consciousness of the father. Vega wasn't aware of his actual identity. Samuel kept that from him to safeguard him from the Dark Lord of Hell. But together again, the two would work to help keep humanity safe from the forces of Hell and usher in a golden era of prosperity with this new Argent energy. 
Very shortly after the completion of the Argent Tower on Mars, Samuel Hayden was diagnosed with stage 4 brain cancer and given only a few months to live. But using Maker technology, he built himself a mechanical body. Coming in at just under 10 feet tall, this new shell would allow Samuel to essentially be immortal. And should he ever need to venture into another realm, like hell, his body would be better suited for it. So, shortly before his human body died, Samuel Hayden transferred his consciousness into a new robot body. He then served solely as the project director of the Argent facility on Mars. Argent energy completely transformed Earth. The energy crisis had grown dire with the depletion of natural resources, and this new form of clean, potent energy was a godsend. It was integrated into every facet of life, completely rendering other forms of energy obsolete. Samuel Hayden and the UAC kept the origins of Argent energy a complete secret, because if humanity knew that they were utilizing the souls of the dead straight from hell to turn on their bathroom lights, well, it might cause a little bit of concern. What was also kept secret were the artifacts uncovered around the fracture. The full extent of what was discovered is unknown, but it's speculated that the artifacts found there assisted in the construction of the Argent Tower, a Vega of Samuel's new body. A particularly powerful artifact called the Helix Stone is known to have been found. The Helix Stone was an object from Hell, and it detailed information about Argent energy, the nature of Hell itself, and the Slayer. It aided Samuel Hayden in effectively learning to harness the power of Argent energy for Earth. And when he was done with it, he sent it back to Olivia Pierce. He had long been trying to recruit her to go to Mars and to work for the UAC, but she repeatedly had declined the offer, saying that she had no interest in the energy business. But when she received the Helix Stone, she became obsessed and abandoned her life on Earth to begin work at the Argent Tower on Mars. And there she became the lead on the Lazarus Project held deep underground to prevent infiltration or escape. The Lazarus Labs were where Olivia Pierce found her great calling. Artifacts uncovered by the UAC expeditions were taken there for study and, well, she became obsessed in particular with that helix stone. She stopped interacting with others. She abandoned her family and friends. She rarely left her office. Not long after her research began, Olivia's body began to deteriorate. Humans just were not meant to experience full exposure to hell nor its artifacts. Her spine began to bend, idiopathic scoliosis. It caused her to be in a wheelchair. She refused to suffer this fate though. Olivia Pierce underwent a surgery that grafted an exoskeleton onto her body, allowing her to walk again. But as a result, she was in constant pain, but she refused to take painkillers. Eventually, Olivia made contact with a powerful demon. It promised her power, freedom, answers, and ascension to godhood. If she helped them, made them weaponry and armor, then they would tell her the secrets of hell and change her weak human body. And Olivia was so rattled with pain, so obsessed with the concept of hell, so desperate to ascend into something greater than her weak self, that she agreed. She would see a gate to hell stabilized. She would empower the demons of hell with new tech, and she would use her own people as fodder to achieve those ends. The UAC tolerated every bit of her changing behavior. She began to alter the nature of employment within the Argent Tower and all of its connected facilities. It became cult-like. Employees were called advocates and promotions were based on how loyal they were to the studies of hell. Their mantra became, the science will cleanse us. As time wore on and months turned into years, rituals, sacrifices, human and demon vivisections, they all began to be normal practices amongst high clearance level advocates. Lower tiered advocates were expected to obey all commands and question nothing. The on-site security personnel enforced every command issued by executives on Mars as though they were law. Samuel Hayden may have aspired to guide humanity into a golden era, to guide them through victory against the forces of hell should the need arise, but he was failing spectacularly. For being an ancient seraphim who'd witnessed firsthand the dangers of mucking with anything related to hell, he was being wildly ignorant as to the happenings taking place in his own house. Olivia Pierce was out of control. In contact with demons, undertaking macabre rituals and victimizing countless people, but he did not act against her. He knew something was amiss, of course. She was dangerous, yet he did not approach it. He let Olivia Pierce continue on unfettered. Eventually, paths into hell were stabilized enough for expeditions to begin. At first, drones went in, but data gathering was limited. Samuel Hayden's mech body allowed him to venture through without fear of impact on him, so in secret, he would take rare ventures in himself. Olivia's new demon masters had ordered her to find the sarcophagus of the one called the Slayer, which rested someplace within Hell. She was able to track the Slayer's resting spot to a particular region, so the first Project Lazarus manned expedition took place in 2145, headed by Samuel Hayden himself. 
It resulted in full loss of human life, but they found the sarcophagus in a place called Cattinger Sanctum. As a contingency plan, should things go to hell in a handbasket, Samuel took custody of the Slayer sarcophagus. He took it away to safety in secret, and he kept it from Olivia. But she knew that her once mentor had betrayed her, and the two had an all-out fight over it. From then on, all attempts at cooperation were completely gone, and Olivia's efforts to appease her demonic masters went into overdrive. More employees were sent to the Lazarus Labs for experimentation. Propaganda was constant and unabashed. People were indoctrinated to believe that hell and demons weren't to be feared, that fear was a false emotion, death at the hands of the hell forces was a bliss, steps were even provided for how to prepare for an expedition into hell if chosen, or what to do if a demon breach occurred. Both could be summarized as kiss your ass goodbye. Expeditions intermittently took place into hell, with their success defined by how much data was able to be sent back to Mars. When a hell gate was close to prepared, the hell priest Dag Ranek began to work with Olivia to plan an all-out invasion. Finally, hell would have another realm to consume, and Olivia Pierce would have her reward. Against all the evil that hell can conjure, all the wickedness that mankind can produce, we will send unto them only you. When he awoke, there was no question as to what he was meant to do. What was it they sang in that ancient arena so long ago? Ah yes, I remember. How could we forget? Rip and tear. Put on your armor, Slayer, there's demons to kill. 